Right, let me ask you to open your Bible to that place, Psalm 19, while you're turning there, I'll beg the pardon of some of our college students who have incredible memories and deep spirituality, who remember that uh, we studied this passage together in one of the Calibrate services uh, several years ago. Uh, being uh, sarcastic, of course, I don't want to necessarily expect you to remember that, but if you're like me, you need a refresher, and I know I do. Psalm 19. Let me read God's word over you. Psalmist is the human author, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that makes this God's word for us. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he's set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Most of you in the room uh, grew up with high-definition television, high-definition broadcasts. Those of us who are a little bit older remember when it wasn't the case. It really didn't become a thing here in the United States, even though its evolution had started before this. It really didn't become popular after the turn of the century, actually, in the early 2000s. I remember hearing about it. I didn't have an HDTV, wanted one. My wife and I moved to Colorado to assume a pastorate there. And the first week we were there, we uh, made an impulse buy, which I don't recommend to anybody, but uh, we were at Sam's, and there it was in the center of the aisle, big screen, had the sign on it, HDTV, and I couldn't resist, so we bought it, took it home, set it up, and uh, for the next week, watched our favorite programs, sporting events um, on that HDTV. I was talking to my brother on a phone toward the end of the week, telling him about it, how excited we were, how cool it was. And he asked me a question. He said, well, he said, are you renting the converter box or did you purchase one? Of course, things got real silent on my end um, because I didn't know that you had to have a converter box to convert HD signals from the broadcaster to the television. You don't have to do that anymore, but when it first started, it's much like a cable box. And so for an entire week, we had been watching all of our favorite shows on this HD TV in the same low definition broadcast that we had always seen. And it's one thing to do that with something as trivial as, t- trivial as television. It's an entirely different thing to do that with something like the glory of God. God is serious about his glory. And he wants us to see it in the clearest definition possible. It could take you to a lot of places. Let me just remind you with a couple of seriousness with which God takes this. David in his song of thanks when they brought the ark into Jerusalem said this in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, declare his glory among the nations his marvelous works among all the peoples. This is something that God wants every nation to hear, every person in every nation to hear, to see, to know his glory. He's serious about his glory. The psalmist in Psalm 62 says this, shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. So so this phrase that we have a tendency to let loosely roll off our tongues, to God be the glory, the glory of God. We sing it in our songs. We preach it in our sermons. But it is something that God is very, very serious about us getting right. 
And I think if reality were known, there's a whole lot of Christians today that are not seeing the glory of God as clearly as he wants us to. I think in this passage of scripture in Psalm 19, we have a word from the Lord in which he is calling us to see his glory in the highest definition possible. I think what we're looking at here in this psalm, which I know is familiar to many of you, is three increasingly higher definitions of the glory of God. And I want you to see them this morning. The first one is what we just read here a moment ago. I'll simply describe it this way, and that is God's natural word, and that's creation. We see the glory of God through his natural word, and that is his creation. This is what the psalmist says. The psalm starts this way. The heavens declare the glory of God. Everything God made, everything he created was intended. Now listen to me. Come in here real close, Christians, because we have a tendency to neglect this, I think, or to presume upon it. He intends to manifest, to broadcast his glory. And this is what he says about it. He, he says it's constant. The verbs in, you know, in, in verse 1, declare and proclaim in my English text are in a tense in the language of the Old Testament. I mean, they're, they're just repeated. It, it keeps going. Heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Verse 2 continues that idea of constancy, and it's just regularity. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. So in the rising of the sun and the setting of it, the change from day to night, God is intending for his glory to be announced through that. This natural word is constant. It's also universal. In verse 3, there's no speech, no words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth, the words of the in, to the end of the world. And I know there's some of you in the room today, some of you listening, maybe on live stream, you speak multiple languages. I wish I could do that. I should have done that. I grew, grew up in West Texas on the border and it was just permeated by Spanish, took it in school. All my friends spoke it, but I had this mental block and I regret it to this day. Many of the rest of you have traveled to places where they speak other languages. You know you have to have a translator. But have you ever thought about the fact with regard to the declaration of God's glory through physical creation, everybody speaks the same language? You know, if, I, if, if it's a clear night and I, you know, I go outside and I look up and I'm looking at the stars that declare the glory of God, somebody in, in Asia that speaks a completely different language looking at the same stars has the opportunity to hear in the same language the glory of God. It's what God does in creation. It's constant. It's universal. So many ways to describe these next few verses. I'm just going to use the word energetic. It's energetic. The psalmist uses the sun as maybe the prime example of God's creation, of the declaration of his glory at the end of verse 4. He says he set a tent for the sun. And, it, and then he uses two similes to describe the vibrancy and the energy and the enthusiasm. He uses the image of a bridegroom that's been in his chamber, and then the doors fling open and he comes out. The athlete who comes out of the blocks and runs his race with confidence, putting into practice, implementing the training that he's done. It's rising is from the end of the heavens. He goes across the sky and circuit to the end of them. I think, I think all of which comes to this place at the end of verse 6, and that is there's nothing, there is nothing hidden from its heat. The psalmist, without the advantage of our modern-day understanding of uh, just uh, uh, astronomy and biology and all the other scientific fields, seems to have some understanding of 
the magnitude of what God has created in the sun. Everything in our universe depends on its regularity. About 98.8% of the solar system's mass is made up of this. It drives our climate. It drives our weather. And, and so it's infusing, having an effect of infusing energy on all of these things. And then, of course, we know we know that all life to some degree depends on the energy that comes from the sun. But do you remember that God intends for that sun and all of his creation in the universe to do what verse 1 says? And that is to declare his glory. But here's the deal. You know this. God's natural word is susceptible not only to our presumption that we forget about his intention to declare his glory, but it, it's, 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 it's also susceptible to misinterpretation. It's easy to miss the glory of God in God's, in God's natural word creation, isn't it? I'm going to show you a couple of pictures this first one I'll put up here on the screen is, um, is a picture of something I got to see every day of eight years. I lived in Denver. We pastored a church in downtown Denver, right in the center. We lived another 2,000 feet up to the west in the foothills. And this is taken from the exit, uh, just uh, two exits actually before, first primary exit before you got to our exit up in the foothills outside of Denver. I got to see that every day. They actually engineered the overpass where this was taken from to not have a middle partition. Most overpasses on the interstate have middle partitions. This one doesn't because they designed it so that when you top that hill, you wouldn't have anything that kept you from seeing that. Now, when I got home, I could go out on my back deck and look at this next picture that you'll see up here, and that is this was taken off of my back deck. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, and you left there, why? Our lives are the Lord's to spend, right? <laughs> you follow his leadership. But I, I, I miss just seeing those big elk just out in my backyard. And, and, I, and I can tell you both with that scene of looking out across the continental divide, you know, just about every evening when I came back home, going home, watching these elk and these big mule deer out in my, you know, in my yard, I, I can tell you, I didn't do it always, but there were many times I remember thinking, God, don't ever let me get over this. Don't ever let me see this and not think of you and worship you as my creator. If you've ever been to Colorado, and it's not just in Colorado, you know this. There's a lot of people in the state of Colorado that looked at that scene looking out over those snow-capped mountains. There's lots of people that, that looked at those same elk, and they didn't worship the creator. They worship the creature. You know why? Because God's natural word declaring his glory is susceptible to our presumption and it's susceptible to our misinterpretation. And God is so serious, so desirous that we would not miss his glory that he gave us a second and I think a higher degree of definition to see it. He declares his glory through his natural word, that's creation, but he also declares his glory through his written word, and that's the scriptures. Some commentators think that there's a break between verse 6 and 7, and it's two different subjects. It's just the literature compiled together. I don't think so. I think the psalmist is taking us to a higher degree of definition in looking at the glory of God. And that's the written scriptures. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, 
righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. We know the psalmist is talking about the written scriptures here. There are six designations in verses 7, 8, and 9, two in each verse. The law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord in verse 7, the precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord in verse 8, the fear of the Lord, the rules of the Lord in verse 9. That's how they're translated in my English translation. If we had time this morning, I'd take you over to Psalm 119, and there you would find every one of these designations as clear designations of, of not just the Word of God, but the written Word of God. And we'll not take the time to do it this morning, but I have no problem making a parallel and application to the entirety of the 66 books of our canon. Notice the psalmist talks about the nature of the written scriptures. It's absolutely amazing. Verse 1, the law of the Lord is perfect. Do a word study on it. Check out the lexicons. Do the language. You'll get a better understanding of what this word perfect means. It means perfect. Perfect. And because it's perfect, look at this, it revives the soul. Listen, the sun can't do that. By photosynthesis, it can energize plants, and living beings, give temporal life and energy, but it can't do that. It cannot do anything to the soul, lift it above the natural. Put it back like it was intended to be. But the glory of God manifested in the written scripture can and does. Testimony of the Lord is sure, it means trustworthy. So it makes wise the simple. You need some wisdom today? Know anybody that does? God's word, written scripture, does that. The precepts of the Lord are right. Language of the Old Testament means straightforward, rejoicing the heart. It doesn't mean the heart is always happy, but that's one of the things about a relationship with God is this condition of joy, even in the midst, even in the midst of undesirable circumstances. You know anybody that could use some joy today? The glory of God manifested through the written scriptures does that. Commandment of the Lord is pure. It means radiant. It's obvious. Illuminates, enlightens the eyes. Why the psalmist would say, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, he says. The fear of the Lord, this was interesting. Yes, in verse 9, that one too is a reference to the written scripture in Psalm 119. Fear of the Lord is clean. It's pure. It's flawless. Enduring forever. Because it is perfect, it's flawless, it's pure, it lasts forever, it's not temporal. Now, what Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, God's physical creation will pass away, but my word will not pass away. You see the, the increasingly clear definition of the glory of God. Verse 9, the rules of the Lord are true, they're faithful, they're sure. The psalmist, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses a participial form, basically making righteous altogether. Physical creation cannot do that. It cannot make us right with God, righteous before Him. And and then the psalmist talks about the value. He doesn't just speak of the nature. He speaks of the value. Verse 10, 
Maybe we could say it like this. It's more pleasing than your, your, your most prized possession. He's talking about gold in verse 10, which was part of the economy of the day, still is part of our monetary economy today. But, but I think the idea is you just take the most valuable thing you can think of. You plug your possession, your most valuable prized possession in right there. Maybe it's your hunting equipment or your, your car or certainly all of us would include the uh, relationships we have, the people. I think this is what he's doing by using this, this image of gold here. He's talking about its value. Not only it's more pleasing than our most prized possession, it's more fulfilling than our favorite food. Second image is of hunting, which was a delicacy during the day, during that day. So plug your favorite food in there when it's your birthday, your mama calls you and says, I want to fix you a meal, or your wife or spouse and says, I'll take you to you know, your favorite restaurant. What, what do you choose? Where do you want to go? Me, I'm you know, probably choosing fried catfish or uh, you know, maybe a, a plate of authentic Mexican food or something. You know, Job said, I've not departed from the commandment of his lips but I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food, more than my favorite food, more pleasing than the most prized possession. It's more fulfilling than our favorite food. But also, he says, it warns us when we do wrong in verse 11. By them is your servant warned, but it also rewards us when we do right. In keeping them, there is great reward. The declaration of the glory of God through his written word, through holy scriptures. It's the most valuable thing that we have, that we possess. But then right at that point here in this psalm, he takes it to, the psalmist takes it to another level because it begins to get personal. Up to this point, he's just describing it. Just, you know, to some degree at a distance, but he knows he can't encounter this manifestation of the glory of God without it doing something to it. And so he says in verse 12, who can discern his errors? Sun's not going to lead you to do that. The moon, the rain, the fog this morning, as beautiful as it is, and as much as it declares the glory of God, is not going to do that. But you can't encounter the word of God without it doing something inside of you, the very core of your being. And the thing that it's leading him to, notice this, the thing that it's leading him to is the reality and the depth of his sin. Who can discern it? Who can get their arms around it? Who can comprehend it? Who can identify it? This is what the scriptures are doing to him. Who can discern his errors? And so he says, pleading with God, declare me innocent from hidden faults. You know what those are, right? Sins that you don't even know you committed. We all do it. Sins that you've forgotten that you committed and never repented of, never confessed. They're off your radar. Things that are now below the surface. They're not out in the open. But notice the word has compelled him to even go there. My lack of spirituality sometimes would say, okay, well, you know, let me just deal with the things that I'm aware of. The word doesn't let him do that. The glory of God won't let him be satisfied with the fact that there may be something that he's not even thinking about anymore. Declare me innocent. Do something about do something about the things that are not even in my memory anymore. This is what the glory of God through the written scriptures is doing. Then he talks about the, the things that are on his radar. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. He knows the grip that... that presumptuous sin can have on our life. You know what that is now. It's, it's one thing to have sinned and not known it or sinned and forgotten about it. It's another thing to encounter God and God says, do this, and you raise your hand. You raise your hand in his presence and you say, I'm going to do it anyway. 
or I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do. Presumptuous, high-handed sin, bold, arrogant disobedience. And he knows the grip that has on our life. Listen, physical creation will never take you there. It'll never take me to that place right there. But God's glory through his written word, through holy scriptures, through the Bible does. And the psalmist says, that's when I'll be blameless. That's when I'll be right with God. Innocent of great transgression. So he turns it to a prayer and he cries out to God and says, Lord, clean it all up. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of heart, what I say, what comes out, what's on the outside, but also what's here on the inside. Physical creation will never do that, brothers and sisters. But the glory of God through the written scriptures will. But listen to me. Scripture was never intended to be an end in and of itself. It was intended to lead us somewhere, more specifically to someone, right? And I think that's where we come to this third and highest degree of the definition of the glory of God. We might categorize it like this, and that is that physical creation is the lowest definition. The written scriptures are high definition. But God's living word, Jesus, is ultra high definition. Because you see, this is where in these increasingly higher definitions of the broadcast of the glory of God are intended to lead. You say, where do you see that in the text? I, I see it in his address to God at the end of verse 14. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's interesting. I, I don't know if you noticed or not or how it plays out in your Bible, but the name God is translated only one time in verses 1 through 6 in this manifestation of God's glory through physical creation. It's translated seven times in verses 7 through 14. In the one time in verses 1 through 6, in the language of the New Testament, the word is just the, the most common uh, name of God, for God as creator. But in verses 7 through 14, it's translated by God's covenant name. Jehovah or Yahweh, his, his, his name of relationship. We've got to start at that point right there, as is our responsibility with every Old Testament scripture. We've got to ask, what does this look like on this side of the cross? And we have to ask, how has God manifested himself as the, the covenant God, the God of relationship in the New Testament? And we know the answer to that, right? He's manifested himself in Jesus. And all the way through the New Testament, we'd find names that in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, are the same names. Names for Yahweh God, the covenant God, names for Jesus. The Apostle Paul would, would say this at one point, very familiar, this is not on the screen, but you know in Philippians chapter 2, and he says there's going to come a day when every knee will bow, those in heaven, of those on the earth, of those under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is who? He's Lord, right? But do you remember what comes after it? To the glory of God the Father. That's what the manifestation of this Lord on this side of the cross looks like. He's described in two ways in this address here in Psalm 19, verse 14. Number one, he says, O Lord, my rock. And let me just go ahead and apply it and tell you that Jesus is our rock. For these Old Testament Hebrews, it, 
If, if you really wanted an understanding of what they would think, or what they thought about the rottenness of God, if I could use that term, all you got to do is turn back one Psalm to Psalm 18 and look at verses 1 and 2. Here's, here's a really good description of what it meant to the Hebrews for God to be their rock. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That's what they thought about when they thought about God being their rock. He was the one they ran to. He was their deliverer. He was their strength. He was their protector. And on and on he would go. It's interesting, is it not, in the New Testament the Apostle Paul would write these words to the Corinthians. He's describing them coming out of Egypt. I'll just jump to verse 4. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Isn't that cool? Old Testament. Interpreted for us here in the New Testament. He is our rock. The Psalm 14 also says this Lord is our redeemer. The Israelites saw God as their redeemer. So many places we could look at. Another one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 130. It ends like this. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, for he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The Israelites saw God as their redeemer. How has he manifested himself as that redeemer on this side of the cross? Well, you know, he's done it in Jesus Christ. Paul would say it this way to the Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hanged on the tree. It's who the psalmist is talking to. Jesus is our redeemer. And he's done what physical creation will never do. He's done as the object, the subject, the goal of the written scriptures. He is for us a God of relationship. And listen to me, he is the one who manifests the glory of God in the highest definition possible. This is why John would begin his gospel this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his what? His glory, right? As of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is the ultra high definition of the glory of God. Technologically, we'll probably come up with other words. We probably already have. I'm just ignorant to them of degrees of definition. But listen, beloved, there will never be any greater degree of definition of the broadcast of the glory of God than in Jesus Christ. So three easy applications, you already know them. One is, let's look for the glory of God in physical creation. Did you notice it when you came over here this morning? Did you think about it in the fog? As you went through a puddle of water, did it make you think of the glory of God? Listen, brothers and sisters, let's be better than the world. The world can enjoy physical creation for what it is, the outdoors and the coolness of the breeze and the rain that waters the earth. But we know what God intends to do with it, first and foremost, and that is for it to cause us to think about and worship Him. So let me challenge you. Don't presume upon it. Don't let it slip by. When you look at physical creation, when you look at the mountains and the rivers and the trees and you, you feel the changes of the season, let it be occasions of worship because it's declaring the glory of God. 
Secondly, immerse yourself in this book. We don't talk about Bible reading and Bible study just because that's what Christians do. We talk about it because God's written scriptures are intended to do something in us that physical creation will never do. Read it, memorize it, meditate on it, proclaim it, declare it. Supernatural. When we say this is the inerrant, infallible word of God, we're, we're not just waving a banner of our theology, we're acknowledging something that is testified in both New Testament and Old Testament, and that is this is a supernatural book. And don't let your journey in seminary be one that squelches, squelches your pursuit of the glory of God and his word. But then finally, don't, don't let your study of the Bible be an end in and of itself. Remember that his written scriptures are intended to get us to the living word, and that's Jesus Christ, the ultimate ultra definition of the broadcast of the glory of God. Let's pray together. God, we pray for your help with this. We want to thank you for your physical creation. We worship you because, Lord, you created all things and by your will they existed and are created. And, and Lord, that makes you one of the many things that makes you worthy of all glory and honor and power. Give us grace in our humanity, Lord, not to miss that. We thank you for our heritage and our tradition when it comes to this book. God, I pray for help not to underestimate what it does that physical creation will never be able to do. And Lord, I want to desire, I want to desire, and I know I speak for my brothers and sisters, uh, we want you to search our depth, the depths of our hearts through it, because we long for the words of our mouth, the meditation of our heart, every part of our being to be right with you. And then Lord, as we pursue you in it, show us Jesus. Reveal yourself to us in the person of Jesus Christ, in your written word, in your physical, in your natural word. And may this semester, this week, Lord, be uh, new occasions for us to know Jesus more and to be instruments of declaring your glory in him to every tribe and nation and tongue and language. For it's in his precious name we pray. Amen.